Now, what type of fiction are we talking about here? What were what were people reading in the late 1700s and early 1800s? Well, if you wanted to kind of narrow it down, there was historical stuff and there was adventure stuff. Yes, all of that. But the two main types of fiction that people were really reading a lot of were the sentimental seduction novel and gothic fiction. Both of those were really sort of the new genres that everybody wanted to read. Now, we're not going to go into all of that. I go into this in very great depth in the American fiction course that I teach, but I, I suffice it to say that some of the things uh, of both of these genres um, kind of come into play during the Romantic period. Now, you're familiar probably with lots of different genres of fiction. There's sci-fi, and there's fantasy, and there's detective fiction, you know, murder mystery stuff. There's westerns, all of this kind of stuff. These are, these are like, these are genres of fiction, within fiction, sort of subgenres, if you will, types. Um, the sentimental seduction novel was very popular at the end of the 18th century with novels like Charlotte Temple and The Coquette, authors like Hannah Webster Fox, Foster and these kinds of folks, um, Charles Brockton Brown a little bit, but more William Hill Brown. Um, all of these guys were writing a lot of fiction that dealt with uh, young female characters who were, how shall we say, put in morally compromising situations. Yes, it, in, it involves sex, scandal, love, sometimes out of wedlock pregnancy, all of those kinds of things that your mama didn't want you to read about. Um, and uh, the primary readership was, in fact, young women who usually were well-educated, upper class or upper middle class. And, uh, you know, you, 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 you didn't dare talk about this kind of stuff, but you could go down to the bookstore and, and ask for a copy of The Coquette, for example. They put it in a plain brown wrapper. You bring it home and late at night you'd take it out from under your pillow and read about some young girl who got in trouble as they used to say, okay? Then, of course, your mother would come upstairs and say, what is it you're reading, and take it away and give you a lecture about not reading filth, and then promptly take it downstairs and read it herself, marking all of the good passages. Um, now, by today's standards, oh, believe me, it's really mild stuff. But for the most part, uh, there's usually uh, a girl who's kind of the naughty girl, and then she's got a best friend who's um, the good girl. Uh, the naughty girl meets some tall, dark stranger who's usually in a uniform, right? He's a military officer, dashing young man, and he's trying to seduce her and have his way with her. And for about 80% of the novel, you read chapter after chapter, and the main plot line goes something like, will they, won't they, will they, won't they, will they, won't they. Then you turn the page and you find out, oh gosh, they did, and now she's pregnant. Um, now, how do they get away with publishing stuff like this, well, the authors would say things like, well, now, I'm not writing this because I want you to, to, uh, to uh, you know, wallow in the lurid details of this. Oh, no, 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 I'm writing this because this is a true tale, and it's a warning to young women all across America. Don't go do all this stuff. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Meanwhile, it's a lot of fun to read about girls who get in trouble, okay? Um, so it's scandal. It's kind of like the soap opera stuff. We wouldn't dare do all that stuff ourselves but it sure is fun reading about it and talking about it with our best friends, right? So that kind of stuff was very, very popular early on. Um, and it had the reputation of being kind of trash fiction. Uh, the, the, now, the other type, which is considerably more interesting, I think, to most modern readers, is gothic fiction. Gothic fiction, and, and probably the most famous example of gothic fiction would be Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. She's not an American writer, but it certainly is well within the gothic tradition, probably the most famous work in the gothic tradition, as I said. Gothic fiction essentially posits that there's more in reality than what human reason and science and rational inquiry can explain. There is a dimension to the universe that is beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding. And so, of course, it deals with things like monsters and ghosts and spirits and spells, and it takes place in dark castles covered with ivory, and, of course, you've got Frankenstein monsters and these sorts of things. You've got uh, uh, the castle of Otranto and the ghost of 
and you you know fill in the blank some exotic name, Waldoweenin or something like that. Um, the castle and ghost of blah blah blah. Um, the spirit of yada yada. Um, and so these are it's fun stuff. It's kind of spooky, scary stuff, but it has a serious aspect to it because Gothic fiction essentially questions the 18th century's view that the world is a knowable place. You know, in the, in the 18th century with Newton and Locke and Franklin and all those guys, they saw the world as being a place that's perfectly understandable. Volcanoes don't happen because God's mad at us. It happens because of uh, the movement in the crust of the earth and lava and all of these kinds of things. Hurricanes don't happen because the gods are angry. They happen because of low-pressure systems coming off of the west coast of Africa, across the Caribbean, and so on and so forth. So, to the 18th century mind, the world is a very knowable place. It's a rational place. And if we don't know the answer to why things happen, it simply is because we haven't done enough research into it yet. And if we'll simply apply science and reason, then we can understand almost anything. Um, the Gothic fiction that exists in the early 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century, questions that and says, you know, we're a bit too big for our pants when it comes to our intellect. And in fact, there is a lot out there that we don't know and we may never understand. There are limits to human knowledge. It emphasizes the spiritual and the mystical within us. It's a kind of a rebellion, a, 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 a fighting back against the 18th century age of reason. Uh, it also gives us sort of this cautionary warning about human nature. I mean, remember what Frankenstein is really all about. Frankenstein is about the limits of human intellect. You know, Dr. Frankenstein tries to create life. Well, that's what God is supposed to be doing, not human beings. Um, and look at what goes wrong when you do that sort of thing. So it's got a kind of didactic, moralistic, cautionary tone to it a lot of the time. Watch out what you do. Modern horror movies do this a lot. Notice all the people who die, the people I call useful idiots, um, all the characters that when they come on the screen, screen you say to yourself, he's going to die. Um, most of those characters have some sort of deep-seated moral flaw to them. Have you ever noticed that? Either they're uh, too uh, gluttonous, too greedy, uh, too proud, too vain. It really reflects the seven deadly sins, in fact, many of these characters. Well, Gothic really engages in that. It does have a kind of didactic strain. It does question the dominant paradigm uh, of reality that existed in the 18th century. Charles Brockton Brown wrote the novel Wheeland and the short piece Carwin and several others. Edgar Huntley is probably the most uh, famous early American Gothic writer, uh, but most people have largely forgotten him. He comes before our period of time here. We'll be dealing with Poe instead. We're going to be looking at Poe, who's dealing with Gothic stuff and some other things, and then we're going to get into Hawthorne. Don't forget this sentimental seduction stuff when we get to Hawthorne.